Hi, I'm Joe Bauer from the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm going to tell you about uh, some of our work and of others in the field of NAD metabolism. First, a couple of disclosures. Uh, these are companies that uh, have either sponsored some of the work in the lab or who I have consulted for. Uh, and to get started, um, this is the general interest of my lab, which is what causes aging and whether there's anything we can do to slow it down. So to take someone with this sort of less successful aging trajectory on top um, and redirect them to a more successful aging trajectory on the bottom. And the best way that we know how to do that right now, uh, at least experimentally in laboratory organisms, is caloric restriction. Uh, so this is a survival curve from a typical calorie restriction experiment where you just simply give the animals less calories. Um, it's female mice in this case. And the inside curve here is the control group fed under normal conditions that you would raise mice under. If you mildly restrict their calorie intake by about 10%, you get the survival curve shown here in the middle uh, where you get a small but significant lifespan extension. Uh, and then if you very severely restrict their, their calorie intake uh, by about 50% of this particular experiment, usually about 40%, um, you get this uh, pretty dramatic shift in the survival curve here where even even the luckiest animals in the control groups uh, are, are dead before the majority of animals in the calorie restricted group. So this can have a really uh, profound effect on lifespan. And it's really accepted at this point to say that calorie restriction really does affect something fundamental about the aging process, not just a few specific causes of death. And so we've been generally interested in, in how this might work and in many different topics related to that. And that was really the driving force for my lab to start thinking about uh, NAD. Uh, because this is one of the things that responds to calorie restriction. Of course, there's many other routes to getting to NAD and many of the other labs that work on NAD uh, never thought about it uh, this particular way. Uh, but for us, it was these observations um, in, in papers like the ones shown here. So this is skeletal muscle NAD content. Uh, if mice of different ages, so six months on the left here or, or 22 or 30 months, which are much older mice, um, near the end of their lifespan. And you can see the muscle, uh, skeletal muscle NAD content is falling pretty dramatically. And on the right-hand side, you can see that if you calorie restrict and then look at aged animals that, that were calorie restricted versus not, uh, you can see that that's restoring the, the muscle NAD content. And we see the same thing with exercise. Uh, so there's gen generally a, a correlation between the NAD content of tissue and these interventions that promote health and longevity. Uh, we've done some work in my own lab in collaboration with Joshua Pinowitz's now uh, to look at NAD levels across a variety of tissues. And so this is just data in our own hand showing that in many tissues, NAD levels do seem to fall. This is 25-month-old mice compared to four-month-old mice. Uh, and you can see in liver, kidney, uh, in skeletal muscle, the quadriceps here, we see decreases in NAD. It's not universal. Um, in our hands, it's not so clear that it falls very much in uh, the pancreas or spleen or stomach, um, but we do definitely see a decline in NAD levels in many tissues with age in mice, and others have uh, reported the same thing in humans. Uh, there's sort of a, a growing body of literature on this now, uh, but clearly it's true in, in the skin, which was the first uh, tissue reported for humans. Um, we were involved in this study with, uh, with colleagues here at Penn uh, and in Ravinder Reddy's lab, who were able to show that there's a correlation between um, uh, NAD concentration in the brain and age by magnetic resonance spectroscopy uh, and in liver biopsies from humans, uh, the same thing has been reported where uh, the people over 60 have much uh, lower NAD levels in the liver than people under 45. So that's why we're interested in NAD. And I think before I uh, continue to show any more data on the subject, of stop and remind everyone exactly what we're talking about, which I possibly remember from biochemistry textbooks, uh, but it's this molecule shown here in the center, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, that plays critical roles in redox metabolism. And so that's shown on the right. It's involved in things like glycolysis, beta oxidation, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, where NAD accepts uh, a hydride ion, so electrons and an H plus, uh, to get uh, reduced to NADH shown on the right. And then that gets reoxidized by processes like uh, donation to complex one of the electron transport chain to fuel mitochondria by the lactate dehydrogenase reaction uh, or, or many other uh, dehydrogenases that, that can use these electrons in different biochemical transformations. And so that cycle is really fundamental to life. Uh, we really have no sustainable 
route to generate ATP or to synthesize many macromolecules without having this uh, ability to shift reducing power back and forth through NAD. Now on the left side, I'm showing consumers of NAD, which are uh, more recently discovered. Uh, they're important in their own right, things like PARPs, CD38, sirtuins, uh, which have critical signaling functions uh, and, and regulate different, different aspects of cellular physiology. But importantly, they actually consume the NAD backbone and release nicotinamide. And so this necessitates a salvage pathway to resynthesize NAD from nicotinamide. Uh, and it creates the possibility that these things can get out of whack. And so the size of the NAD pool can change if the consumer activity gets upregulated inappropriately or for some reason salvage synthesis is blocked. Uh, and that affects both sides of the slide uh, because once the NAD pool falls, then it's not, no longer available for these redox reactions, even though the redox reactions themselves uh, don't consume the NAD, they allow you to regenerate it. And so even from what I've already said, I think it's clear that NAD is completely essential for life. If you don't have it, that's gonna be lethal. Uh, we actually have human data to prove that um, because it turns out that a deficiency for NAD precursors is the cause of the disease pellagra, which was endemic in the Southern US uh, in the early 1900s and leads to what was known as the four Ds, dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia, and death. Uh, so if not treated, uh, this disease really can go on to, to become fatal, in, even when you obviously still do have some NAD levels present in the body. So this discovery that that pellagra is caused by an NAD deficiency is integrally uh, related with the discovery of NAD in the first place. And so I'll give you a little bit of history on that, um, starting with the discovery of co-ferment, uh, which was by Hardin and Young in, in 1906. Uh, they were doing experiments with boiled yeast extracts where they discovered that there was a substance present in the yeast, even after boiling, that could accelerate the fermentation of alcohol. Uh, they named it co-ferment, not really knowing anything else about it at the time, other than it was something that could survive boiling. Uh, between 1914 and 1929, Joseph Goldberger uh, was active in trying to establish that pellagra was a nutritional disorder. It had been debated whether it was an infectious disease and that the cause hadn't been understood. And he was actually uh, able to demonstrate that if you improved the quality of the diet of people suffering from pellagra, particularly adding meat and milk, um, you could cure the disorder. In the 1920s, uh, Hans von Euler Schelpen discovered that co-ferment is actually a nucleotide. So the substance that can accelerate um, the fermentation of alcohol was something that had a nucleotide structure, um, still not knowing what it was. Warburg and Christian went on to determine that it actually contains a nicotinamide moiety, which is what actually supports the redox reactions since nicotinamide uh, when attached to uh, a backbone is, is capable of accepting the hydride ion. And finally, Conrad Elvagem and colleagues put it all together uh, at the end of the 1930s, and we're able to show that nicotinamide and nicotinic acid can prevent pellagra uh, and contribute to the synthesis of this redox active nucleotide, uh, which, which turns out to be NAD, obviously. Uh, and so that was a, a real tour de force and established nicotinamide and nicotinic acid as vitamin B3, something essential that we need um, to, to prevent the onset of pellagra and obviously uh, facilitated curing this disease effectively in, in, in Western countries that could afford the vitamin supplements. And so since then, the, the question that's been left to be answered is, do the NAD levels still matter once you've avoided pellagra? Uh, after the 1940s, uh, pretty much you were considered to have sufficient levels of NAD if you weren't suffering from pellagra. And so it's really only recently that we've uh, revisited this question and asked whether there might be some benefit to boosting NAD levels in, in people that are uh, apparently healthy. And there's a few different reasons to think that might be the case. Uh, one of them is that NAD levels are circadian, uh, and so at least uh, in the liver and in several other tissues, our body has seen fit uh, to put a lot of effort into regulating the levels of NAD biosynthetic enzymes here on the top. Uh, this is nicotinamide phosphoribosyl transferase and the black trace shows the, the nice circadian rhythm in a wild type liver. Uh, the white dots show a, a clock mutant. So if you break up the circadian clock, you also lose rhythmic expression of NAD biosynthetic enzymes. And on the bottom, you can see the result that the NAD levels are actually going up and down in the liver over a circadian time course. Uh, in addition, there's a growing body of literature showing uh, that in humans, NAD level doesn't just correlate with age, 
but also with functional status. Uh, so really suggesting that there, there might be a, a real benefit to having a little bit higher level of NAD even within the normal range. And, and so the, the large metabolomics graph over here on the left is just highlighting the fact that if you rank metabolites based on either the age or the functional status, of individuals, NAD really shows up as something that gets downregulated in either case, either by age or functional status, uh, and stands out uh, among all the other metabolites that were measured in this particular study. The inset up here on the right um, makes another point, which is that functional status really plays a critical role here. So if you look in the older adults and then the three groups on the right, um, you can see on average, there's lower NAD levels in, than in the younger adults as expected. But if you look at exercise trained older adults here, the second group, um, their NAD levels in the muscle actually aren't even statistically significantly different from those of young adults. And so this is something uh, that you can potentially modulate through, through exercise and then healthier habits. Um, and it's something that, that really reflects the function. <laughs>